Hello, everyone, and welcome back. It was an excellent presentation by Joy K, and uh, I look at the massively build they have. Uh, right now, we're going to switch gears. We're going to talk with Trish Cloud and uh, several other guest speakers, and we're all going to talk about Minecraft After School Clubs. So, as always, I'll turn it over to Kay. Uh, but one thing is, is, if you look at the screen right now, you'll see we're, we're now talking about the home of the mighty Techie Owls. So, uh, happy holidays, Techie Owls, and I'll turn it over to Kay. Yes, what we did there is we picked up a, we, we just brought up a Google Hangout. Um, Trish Cloud, who is going to be our guest speaker here, um, she put this in our, our Guild community site. And what, she, and what she was showing us there really was, um, I believe, in her classroom, her Techie Owl classroom. But we're going to turn the presentation over to her now so she can talk about Minecraft After School Clubs. Hi, um, my name is Trish, and I work at Grand Oak Elementary in Huntersville, North Carolina. And I have this is the second school that I have started a Minecraft club at. I started last year at uh, Torrance Creek Elementary, and we were. I knew how much fun Minecraft was because my daughters played it and I knew how much popularity it was gaining and I was also interested in things from the from the games in school education point of view so and I knew that I wasn't going to be able to get games in through the front door per se <laughs> because of the fact that most administration kind of look askance at people who game and look at gaming in general still. It's not considered mainstream. So doing it this way, I had a very fairly open-minded principle and this was the way that I figured we could get it in and get it more known about by the population in general is by doing it in an after school game. Um, what I did was, next slide Chris, okay, one of the things is, is that Minecraft appeals to all ages and it also doesn't have a negative connotation attached to it in any way shape or form other than parents saying I can't get my kid to stop playing it. <laughs> um, go ahead. Oh Trish, I was gonna say I think you're making a real point there and if anybody else wants to join in, you're right. And we did an earlier session and we had Roxy and she was talking about how her kindergarten kids like to show it to her. And then we had and then we had Sherry Jones who teaches rhetoric and composition at the college level and about how she was bringing it in and how her students were engaged. And she teaches at a community college, so that means that she doesn't even have traditional age students. She could mm -hmm. have students anywhere from 18 to 60, depending on, on you know, who signs up for the class. So I, I think your decision there was you, that you hit it right on the head when it came to that. Well, and I also knew that the way I was thinking was I wasn't just thinking about myself in elementary school terms I was also thinking about the fact there were middle schools and high schools also in our school district and whatever I picked I wanted it to apply and personally I'm a huge fan of World of Warcraft but I also knew that World of Warcraft could not be played by elementary age kids so I um, so and and also there like i said there were no bad negative connotations about minecraft in that there there is no violence overt violence there was no um shoot 'em ups it it was all pretty much just a crafting kind of thing so um next slide chris So, 
what I did was is I went to our instructional technology specialist in the district and I found one who was very like-minded because her son was playing Minecraft. So, and <laughs> so, so you identify you went and you and you really selected the correct target. Well, she was also <laughs> the instructional technology specialist who would come to our school to train our staff on the new technology that was coming into the district. Mm -hmm. And so as we were talking, we both discovered this thing about Minecraft and so she was asking me questions like is this game okay for my son to be playing and I'm saying oh yeah it's yeah. perfectly fine <laughs> and so I started talking to her about how we could get it in the school and so that's when she started tossing about the word pilot we can pilot it at your school <laughs> And, you, and use pilot as a verb and a noun, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and um, because there were many considerations that you had to keep in mind because I'm in a large district. And when you're talking about bringing something that is quote unquote not district approved, mm -hmm. you have to go through some various hoop jumps in order to find out if it's going to if you can get it in. Now, as I already had 60 iPads, so getting putting putting Minecraft PE on, on the iPads, no problem. But as far as bringing Minecraft desktop version into the school, that was a completely different animal. So we had to go through different avenues to make sure that technology, technologically speaking, that we weren't going to break anything. And um, so she was very integral in smoothing the pathway for me with my principal and with the instructional technology area of saying she's going to pilot this, we're going to see how it runs, we're going to have the professionals do the first install to see if it's mm -hmm. something that the tech contacts can do themselves once we get this first one done. And all it did was just sort of set the standard for the district to where other schools would be able to do it mm -hmm. after us. So that was how we got started. And next slide. Um, then we had to think about are we going to use regular Minecraft, Minecraft EDU, or Pocket Edition Minecraft. In my case, I got started with Pocket Edition Minecraft because it was readily available, it was cheap, it was easy to get, and we didn't have to worry about CMS being involved in any way in that because we could just install it on the iPads. Um, if you have a lot of iPads in your district, you might be using the volume purchasing portal. This does not qualify for half price or any kind of discount. It's $6.99 no matter what. So then we were looking at, okay, can we do regular Minecraft or Minecraft EDU? For us, just off of the money aspect strictly, we ended up using Minecraft EDU just simply because each license is about half the price of regular Minecraft. So my regular Minecraft has later versions. It's um, It has um, probably more bells and whistles than the version that Minecraft EDU uses. But still, again, I liked what Minecraft EDU had to offer for us in the school environment better than regular Minecraft, which I'll get into in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Next slide. And here we looked at the cost. Regular Minecraft is about $30 per license. Minecraft EDU is about $13 per license. And Pocket Edition is $6.99 per app. Next slide. Okay, how are you going to pay for it? What I did and what worked at my school was I, the first year of the club, I charged the miners, which is what I call my people who play Minecraft, 
I charge them $10 to $15 per student. If they really can't afford it, usually there's enough left over to where we can let a couple slide. But the $10 to $15 per student usually ends up covering the cost of the desktop version and all the pocket edition versions that you need. Considering the fact that the first year I had 90, close to close to 90 kids sign up, so there was enough to cover the cost the first year at Torrance Creek and they're still playing it this year. I heard they had 140 kids sign up to oh, be in the Minecraft club. <laughs> Oh, and that's something that that we will, uh, that we probably want to point out is that that Trish, you um you have you have switched jobs, so you started it at one school district, right? And now you've brought now you've switched jobs, and now you're working at 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 another school district, correct? No, I'm in the same district. Oh, I'm just district, at a different but... school. I'm just in a different school, same district, different school, and. I just found out earlier this week that she was having, she's really, that they, they didn't have someone who really cared about the game, but a teacher has stepped forward to run the club at Torrance Creek um, for the kids, and she has X number of kids meet the first Monday, X number meet the second Monday, and so on and so forth, so everybody gets a chance. Um, I had 90 kids sign up at Grand Oak, where I am, and a lot more, but they're on the waiting list. Oh my and gosh! <laughs> so I um I have forty five that I have meeting this first semester, and then I'll have forty five the second semester. So they I have thirty on desktops and fifteen on iPads. Oh, oh my gosh! <laughs> I'm just curious about these licenses. Um, mm -hmm. I, I guess they're you know you're paying for per use at the school. What happens after school hours? And this is X number of licenses for the entire day, right? So what happens at night if they want to play at night? From home? Um, they are they can't play at night. Not with Minecraft Edu. If we had awesome. a remote server. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll explain this a little bit more when I'm talking because of the fact that we're in elementary school. Mm -hmm. We, if you'll go ahead and switch to the next slide, um, this is where I, a lot of ours came in from. Um, our district won't allow us to have to put a server in the building as as like a real live server. And the cost for um, the cost of um, doing a remote server through one of the services is a little bit more than most schools want to pay for. So what we do is that when you're playing Minecraft EDU, you can start their server tool on a computer, and then you can hook up five, ten, two. 20, you can hook up that many kids to that server that's running off that one computer. So what I do is I have students paired up in groups of two to five, and they work together on that server, And um, but the problem is they can't do it once they leave school. But we are trying very hard to obey the SIPA, COPPA, and FERPA in everything that we do. And so for safety's sake, we everybody seems to think running that server locally within the school is probably the best thing to do as far as protecting the children's privacy. And um, we just decided that... Um, However, I do know that like Lucas down in Pender mm -hmm. County, they run they run mm -hmm. servers their children can their students can access after school hours and can access them 24/7. But our servers is just it's just something they can do on Mondays when they're at Minecraft Club. And uh, and that's that's I I have to say that that part is really 
is really interesting. All the different ways that we're hearing about Minecraft being brought into to the classroom. Because you're right, Lucas Gillespie is, they're running their own server, Pender County. Um, when we visited with Marianne Malstrom, they're, they're going ahead and, and they're, they're running their own server. I, I mean, for for us, we you know, the games MOOC one, and we're gonna or we're gonna do the 30 day challenge. Um, we we got a service provider just because it was really it was really inexpensive to do that for mm -hmm. us. So I mean, there's there's a lot of different, and then there's Minecraft Edu, and that's another option. So, yeah, and and what we found that um, and and honestly. If I can present something to my principal that's not going to cost him money, he's going to be more likely to let me do it <laughs> than if I start coming to him and saying, oh, we need to buy server or we need to uh, rent server time or we mm -hmm. need to do this. Yeah. And, and um, CMS in my school district was not keen on us allowing us to set up a server at the school. Mm -hmm. And that's just part of the fact of sometimes being in a larger district. There's mm -hmm. bigger fences that you have to scale. And um, we just have to learn to work within the yard that we're provided. Exactly. And it's funny. It's back to the, it's back to the rules discussion we had. <laughs> <You know>? mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, what are the parameters? What can I do? And, and I mean, how, how can I go ahead and bring either this or any kind of game? into the school because I, I really see and I don't know if other people want to chime in I really see Minecraft as kind of the gateway to bringing in other you know immersive games and virtual worlds and digital building I, I really see it as the gateway of bringing that in into the into the classroom well and it could be unfortunately I, last night when Lucas was talking he was talking about portal well one of the problems with portal that I, I immediately tried to get Portal in to, to try to see if the kids could get a grasp of that and get a beginning understanding of physics. But the problem with Portal is you have to go through Portal through the Steam client. And um, you can't just access it alone. It has You have to go in through the Steam client and when our um, filtering guys looked at it they said mm, if we open that up because they can't just open something up at one school they have to open it up everywhere and they said if we open up to people to be access, be able to access steam that's opening up stuff that we're not going to open up for the school so that was one of the reasons we couldn't do mm -hmm. portal um, and you were asking if kids using the mobile version of Minecraft can play in the same multiplayer world. Yes, they can because um, we couldn't do it last year with the Wi-Fi at Torrance Creek, but this year I'm noticing that the iPads are connecting via Wi-Fi and there is an app called Minecraft Multiplayer that is $2.99 that I purchased for my Minecraft iPads and it allows the students to connect via Bluetooth. So when I have the 15 kids playing Minecraft, they're all huddled up on the floor over there and they're all connected up playing, playing together in that world. So it, um, they, they, they can play together and I and if Wi-Fi is not working, they connect through Bluetooth and so they're, the, the iPads do connect. <laughs> you know, I just want to, when you talk about, um, of course, these privacy things are, are very important and, you know, keeping kids safe is vital. But just the session earlier when we were talking to Joe Kay, and of course she's in Australia, it is a different country, uh, but uh, she talked about a lot, of the that, that a lot of students that are accessing massively Minecraft are students who have dropped out of the regular schools public school system for whatever reason mm -hmm. and they, their parents have pulled them out and I, I also work for a very large district and we're seeing our kids leaving the large public schools and they are going to charters and privates um, that might be something to consider you know for a large school district because when you lose children you're also losing 
the money that comes with those children and that can make a big impact and if we're not offering the, the latest tools and the things that small charter and private schools are offering we might be losing those children and their FTE. What's FTE? Oh, uh, FD, oh. <laughs> the full-time equivalent, the money that we get for the kids from the state. The okay. full-time equivalent. Money, <laughs> money from the state or mm -hmm. money from the state for um, basically it, it's full-time full enrollment it, it, well, is usually what it means. Um, well, what we're finding is that it's still considered to be... Um, you know, I have a, every Monday that it's Minecraft Day, I wear, I have a couple of Minecraft t-shirts and I wear a <laughs> Minecraft t-shirt on Mondays and they know it's Minecraft Day. And starting from the minute I walk through the doors until the end of the day, I have kindergartners through fifth graders telling me they love my shirt and then they have to stop me in the hall and tell me what they're building, whether they're building it at home, whether they're building it on an iPad or telling me about mm -hmm. what they're going to do that day in the Minecraft club. So it is universally, um, it's it's still, and even the ones who don't play really well, and what's really cool about the Minecraft Club is that a lot of kids, particularly first graders, mm -hmm. they've never really had an opportunity to play desktop, and they come in to the Minecraft Club and they get to try to play the desktop version, and then they get an older kid helping them with the desktop version, and they have so much fun just doing things differently because it just opens up a different world to them when they're on the desktop version as opposed to being on the pocket edition. And and you know what? Uh, we we had some comments. Um, well, I shouldn't say comments, but in our first session today, um, Rosie Wojcik, who's an elementary school principal, her students are, are chasing her down also to show what they're doing in Minecraft. Mm -hmm. And when she eats lunch with them, they just open up and tell her more about what they're doing in Minecraft and things like that. And at the same time, um, we had her her husband um, Robert, who and I'm gonna botch the title, but he's like the uh, director of technology for for the district area, and he was explaining. We started chatting, and he was saying that these games have to give the students skills for the desktop because when they have to take all these standardized tests that there's that are coming up, they will be taking those on a computer. Yeah, and in fact. Um we, we're doing a, a test right now that requires a desktop and in fact they have come up with an iPad version but our connectivity has been a little wishy-washy being in a new school so we're doing it on the desktop and I still have kindergartners who sit down in front of the computer and cry because it's so big and they don't know oh, what to do with the mouse that's <laughs> and I have to I have to coax them through the test mm -hmm. but it's just it's just that they're just not used to it because probably since they were three they've mm -hmm. had an iPhone or an iPad or an Android device in their hand mm -hmm. and they just in you know mouse manipulation is kinda tough for those mm -hmm. little bitty hands so um, it is really good when you can put a first grader on a computer and even if they're kind of standing in the chair and having to lean way over to, to reach the computer, oh. <laughs> it's, it's, it's still, if they're doing Minecraft though, they're learning something fun and they get mm -hmm. so excited when they've done something new that they've never done before. Um, Chris, what's the next slide? Oh yes, <laughs> be prepared. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I did this year in order that there would not be any, um, I could back myself up with, with data, which I don't use very much of, is that I created a Google form and I put the Google form on the Techie Owls website and then 
the word got out that the Minecraft Club signups had started and the moms all they have to do is go fill out a few blocks on the Google form it immediately feeds into the spreadsheet and my Google Drive and I have the time and date that they signed up that way <laughs> I'm taking them literally on a first come first served basis so no one could say that I was playing favorites and you took my child but you didn't take the other one and be prepared no matter how much you try you're gonna get angry moms because they're gonna figure that somehow their kid got left out and um, I can be very accommodating but it, you hit a point to where you just can't be accommodating anymore because you just maxed out your limit on how many kids you can take in the club but one of the coolest things I did this year was that in order to handle this many students I created a sign up genius for each club session and ask for a mom or a dad to sign up and come help me in the club and pretty much I tell them you don't have to know how to play Minecraft what I really need is just crowd control and you're willing <laughs> and you're willing to um, and you're willing to just be there if there's an emergency and so it's, so it's kinda like you know you need extra security for um, you know Black Friday yeah uh. <laughs> exactly and um, what's really cool is watching these moms come in and watching their expressions as they're in there because it is really noisy because you put 45 kids together in a room and they're all talking about what they're doing and they're talking together and they're trying to complete the quest from Lucas Gillespie's survival quest challenge and they're building portals to the nether and they're trying to find each other and this isn't working or whatever and a mom stood there and she said this is amazing she said they're really noisy but they're so engaged she said they are having so much fun but they are they're not being disruptive they're just having fun and I said yeah I said that is what Minecraft is and she's like I never knew that they were having this much fun and it was this engaging for them and I said oh yeah this is all they do is they're not sitting there chit chatting and talking about how they're in trouble they are <laughs> they are actually talking about okay you need to go build this over here while I stay here and you need to go kill the creeper over there while I try to collect what we need right here and how are we going to do this and they're working out the ins and outs of how they're going to co complete the task that's before them and the moms have been just astounded at and it's been good because mm -hmm. so many moms get freaked out that their kid is playing a game this much and they don't understand that concept of, of um, oh, they just don't know what the engage the engagement and the learning that's happening. Right, and if they, they don't, haven't been there, it's that hard fun that we talk about <laughs> so oh, much. Yeah, yeah, the challenge, the 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 die and do over, got to do it yes. again, figure it out again. <laughs> Let me try it one more time. Yeah, and exactly. and I and I really do have to say when it, when it comes to that. I, I can tell, and this doesn't matter, K through 12, or even at a college, if you are in a hallway with classrooms, you can absolutely tell, you know, just from the noise, what classrooms are using game-based learning and which ones aren't. It's, <laughs> it is so, and I can tell you that I learned this teaching agribusiness and just, you know, doing a commodities, a commodities game. There's a difference when you pull that you know, when you pull out something like that compared to compared to the lecturing or or anything else. Mm -hmm. And and um, they get so excited when you can do this with them. Chris, can we go to the next slide? Okay, that was all about the servers. And next. Okay, um, much like Laura did, I we have some rules. The biggest rule is don't steal from other people and no trolling. And um, any time that and, and the fact is is that they play really really well together. In that um, I've only had a couple instances where someone has taken something from someone else's chest 
and the only reason they took it is they did not know that it belonged to someone else and as soon as they found out that they had taken something they weren't supposed to they gave it immediately back um, and I haven't had any problems with that what I did do at the beginning of the year is I asked them you have a choice you can do the survival quest challenge or you can be in creative mode and create whatever you like and it ended up being about 50-50 however I will say most of the girls went for creative and a lot of the boys went for survival but I've had several boys go okay I just want to go do creative I'm tired of trying to survive <laughs> but they've um, the, it's really great watching them check things off on the survival quest mm -hmm. as they can complete each section and they get an adult to sign it off because they have to show the adult on their screen that they've completed that before it'll be signed off on so we right now we've got tons of amusement parks being built one that actually has a metal detector and a place oh, to um, <laughs> and a place to um, scan your season pass and um, we have a couple of really large houses and um, I have a little boy building his iron golem and um, it, okay. <laughs> they're, they're, they're doing all kinds of really really fun things oh and one thing I just wanted to say because because we are tossing in Minecraft scenarios I mean Minecraft scenes as we're going along what we've been showing you is, is Joycadia so um, Trevin's been pulling as you've been discussing what the techie owls are doing Trevin's been finding like equivalent places on on, on Joycadia that relate so so I just want people to know if you're watching this you are watching it you are you are seeing you are seeing Joy, Joycadia because um, Trish's club is not meeting today <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a question for you Trish in terms of I know it's an after-school club have your teachers in the in their academic classrooms have they reported perhaps any connections to Minecraft that might improve their skills in math geometry algebra little, um, anything you know the teachers the teachers particularly in writing the teachers are telling me that um, that if given the option to write a lot of times the kids will write about Minecraft because that's what they like to write about mm -hmm. um, as far as math goes I do know from my friend who was the instructional technology who is the instructional technology specialist her son uses Minecraft to solve math problems especially ones where a pattern is involved of the he gets that you have uh, a certain number and you have to say what would the 20th row be like well he builds it in Minecraft so that he can solve it that way mm -hmm. um, but as far as them the students don't really have access to it in their classrooms at all during the school day so and still it's a thing of once they go home their parents see it as a game not as a tool that could be used for other things so, right, so they're not seeing that connection yet no it's in, in a lot of ways even with the things that I do they'll see the connection for that brief moment but as far as a solid connection that carries through into the school day out into the classroom I'm not seeing others make the connection yet I've made the connection but I don't see other people making the connection yet it would be interesting I suppose if you had a, a higher ed partner or something to perhaps do some sort of a correlation on the students who've been <laughs> with the Minecraft club and you know how do they do in their achieve not just the fact that they can actually log on to a computer and know how to use it to take the test but you know how do they do in in a, in a test like the common core test or whatever the state test is in, in your particular state um, I, I guess I, I'm there's no doubt that there's some data there 
in my mind. There's, there, I'm sure that there would be a correlation, but I suppose you just have to maybe announce it so some higher ed person might hear and say, I'll do it. <laughs> Data. <laughs> Absolutely. Next slide, Chris. If I could jump in with a quick question, Trish. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the topics that has come up, like with my after school Minecraft club, is the topic of griefers. Now, we definitely have our own, you know, charter and our rules that we follow as a group. But as the students are playing at home, you know, they're playing on different servers. Their parents may be monitoring, or maybe not, or maybe are unaware of the different environments where the students are playing. And we have often talked about, like, what are some strategies? that they use outside of school um, just to help others become aware and it's always interesting to hear what are some of the things that they do but they're being exposed to players that aren't following the same kinds of rules so I was wondering um, if you may have any ideas on how to handle that um, with students well you know that is like that is one of the things that um, that I cover when I'm just talking to my students about digital citizenship is that because when I talk to them about digital citizenship I talk about the fact that most of them even the ones who are in first grade are playing in some kind of online world whether it's Club Penguin whether it's um, Roblox whether it's uh, you know any of them. There's several, you know, even the first graders are frequently online in virtual worlds. And I just tell them, you know, number one, if someone's doing that, you need to first get an adult to talk to them about it. Because even if someone is griefing you, you need to get an adult. And if that doesn't take care of it, you get in touch with the moderator on that server. And what this is where you run into a, a very um, gray kind of nebulous area because if parents aren't watching the server that their child is signing on to they really don't know how old the people are that they're dealing with and if you've got young kids I I, I have a I don't know that I would want them playing on a server with a bunch of 30 and 40 year olds because of the fact it's just a difference in mindset and that's one of the reasons that um, I always refer kids to Joy Kata because I just think that if they're gonna play on a server I'd rather them be on a server with a bunch of kids their own age and in that case I know that there's a moderator and I know that if any kind of griefing does go on they know they need to get an adult and not respond in kind, but get an adult and try to handle the situation as the, the way they've been taught as far as being a good digital citizen. Exactly. Great strategies. Um, and really, it's important, I think, to help educate the parents as well. Um, so maybe even part of uh, some of the resources that we get together could be for you know educating parents and showing them some options and strategies that they can use as well. Exactly. And I really like Kay had put something online about the gamer mom and how there yeah. are, <laughs> there's more and more women who are out there who are gamers, whether they are whether they consider themselves a gamer or not, but the fact that you know if they're playing words with friends, they still are playing games. But it's the the way that um, the moms play a pivotal role in watching what their kids are playing and who their kids are playing with. Um, and I think that is very important even with Minecraft as somewhat benign as Minecraft can be you still need to know where your kid is playing and what server they're on and making sure that their behavior is being responsible and that they're being a good digital citizen and even if others are being bad, teaching them how to handle those situations. Um, I did want to talk about the one of the greatest things that I've seen come out of the Minecraft Club is the fact that it can make a rock star out of a kid who is generally not considered one of the popular kids. 
and it can cause the shy and retiring kid or the kid who might have a little bit of a stutter or the kid who might be a little withdrawn it can give them an avenue to shine and to be because Minecraft I think I've said before is the great equalizer socially because you don't have to be big and strong and handsome to play Minecraft you can just be an average kid and um, and as I said too particularly for boys who it's very hard to get them writing sometimes you can get them writing about Minecraft they'll make up a story about Minecraft or they'll tell you how to survive the night in Minecraft or give you a step-by-step -step handbook on how to build something in Minecraft so it is one of the ways that you can do that Chris next slide Yes, and last year we had between 60 and 75 at most sessions. Um, I did start at Torrance Creek this year, and since then it has started at several other uh, elementary and middle schools throughout the district. And so far this year I've got 45 signed up for each semester. Next slide. Oh, the last slide of this presentation I've given some links but one of the things that I did do was that um, this year before that Thanksgiving break as my classes came in I set up servers around the classroom with so many students at each one and I had them um, team together to build a Thanksgiving scene for I think right before Thanksgiving break so they were building wooden picnic tables and wooden cabins and things like that so that it could so they could tell what their interpretation was based on Minecraft of what Thanksgiving would be like and it was really great in that there were many kids in these classes who had never played Minecraft before and the other kids were stepping in and ganging up around them and helping them learn how to navigate and how to turn and how to do all the controls that they needed to do so it ended up being a really fun experiment and I didn't get in trouble for it for doing it during regular school hours and yeah, no, that that was a fun one, and I think I think that's another great strategy, Trish, that you came up with. This is a Thanksgiving scene. Well, maybe there's some historical thing that you're covering this quarter. So this mm -hmm. quarter, you're just going to take them in for that historical thing. You know, right. it's not like you're playing all the time. It's, no. They're going to go in and recreate, and I'm sure you guys can give me a perfect example. <laughs> Uh -huh. They're going to go do that one. I, I think that you have become a master strategist when it comes <laughs> to bringing in game-based learning into the classroom. <laughs> well, I can usually find some way to work it into the day. And, um, and, uh, and right here you can see um, I gave you, um, there's a link to Lucas Gillespie's Survival Quest Challenge, which is really, really good. And then there's the Flickr group of the Thanksgiving builds. And these are just computer <laughs> pictures taken with my iPad of the computer screen. Um, the Scribble Press book is a Scribble Press book that a third grader wrote of his introduction to Minecraft. And then I included. Um, some blog entries from my kids last year and then the wiki where you can find out um, everything that we've done and the instructional technology specialist and a tech facilitator from another school have contributed to it too on how to get a Minecraft EDU club started at your school so there's step-by-step -step instructions on how to do it all at that link so 
No, I, I think that's great. And and I know we're running late, so anybody who is actually tuning in for um, uh, tuning in for the basic building, the basic building will be delayed a half an hour <laughs> so that we can continue this. Uh, so we can continue this a bit. So so Laura. Um, we we really brought you in so that because you've done something you've done something similar with what by byod for for Minecraft and I, I got to listen to how Trish has done it also um, so can can you give us some can you relate what you've done and also give us <laughs> you know <laughs> tell us what you think about what Trish has done too yes. Um, what Trish has been talking about um, is fabulous. Um, it's given me a lot of ideas for how I can improve and add to the program that I currently have um, at my school and during the summer. Um, some of the things that we do, um, we talked a little bit earlier about um, I have like two separate sign-ups for the students and one of them is to use one of our school devices and we only have the free version of Minecraft installed on those iPads and then the other group of students are able to bring their own device and their parents have to sign a, a BYOD agreement and things like that and um, we've created that on our own because our district doesn't have a BYOD policy um, that's still in progress you know at the district level and but my principal has been very supportive um, of that and students have brought all different kind of devices and one of our issues has been that we weren't able to connect or join. Um, all the devices were getting the Wi-Fi, but we weren't able to actually have them join so they could build together and see each other, um, you know, in the game. And so what we did was we actually sometimes students worked as partners, sometimes they you know, would work individually, and we would give them different challenges for building things. And what was really amazing too is you know we only were there for an hour and 15 minutes after school um, once a week for our sessions. And but students would work at home, and they would bring things in, and we'd show them how to make snapshots and everything or they would email me snapshots if they were using the actual computer software version and the stuff they were making was like so amazing I had posted some of those on Twitter actually some of the photos and they were just so excited to share what they had made and kids would say well how did you make it how did you do it and you know so they would share strategies for um, building different things using redstone uh, making the circuits um, and what was really good is that all the students were of different abilities. Um, we had kindergartners through fifth graders, and you know the little kindergartner was amazing. I mean, he like knew more than one of the fifth graders even. You know, so when everyone's at a different level, but they all and like um, like Tris was saying, the the excitement in the room and the noise level was. It's like a parent came in one time and asked me. She said. Um, you know, I'm wondering, do you have a curriculum for this? And I said, well, we, we don't have an exact curriculum because it's an after-school option for, you know, an after-school program. And, but I said, we do offer different kinds of challenges. Students are teaching each other strategies and ways to build. And the mom sort of said, well, is that so it's just free time then? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, students have those options for building and sharing strategies. Um, but so that really is the sign too that you know parents really need some information and some resources and to be educated about it because you know in an after school program there was no structured curriculum per se um, and the idea too of relating you know academic projects and common core standards and uh, we have standards of learning Virginia actually doesn't participate with common core um, but they're they're all related, needless to say, and you know that is really um, one of the important things I think that we could really do to help teachers because then they could also see ways that they could incorporate it into their subject areas. Um, I have teachers now, even for example, that want to use the Minecraft app during math or whatever, but we haven't really taken that step yet because it's not you know even like as Tris said, it's not an approved district kind of thing we're sort of in a, like a pilot phase and um, 
my administrator has been really supportive of it, so I think even, you know, one of my next steps is to talk with her about it more and see, you know, how we can work it into the classroom and, you know, can we have certain objectives and have students building certain things and, um, you know, helping to educate the teachers as well that it's just not a game, but it can be a learning tool. Um, and I think that's going to be a really important step that we take um, and even with our networking and collaboration, mm -hmm. if we can get those resources together, um, and it would definitely be a help for teachers. Um, I, I, I think you're right. I, th I think it is. I, I loved what, what Rosie was saying about going ahead and, and collaborating on this. I, I think that it's going to need the seal of approval of a lot of different places <laughs> for the average teacher to go ahead and bring it in. Right. And... Um, it, over on the wiki, there are several couple of places. There is a, an infographic that I made last year of all the Common Core standards that it meets for math and re reading and writing um, for third through fifth grade, and it's also math too. So I, I went through and just listed all the ones that it did meet that it, that it did meet, but it's just there still is this gap between, but I think the gap exists there for most people who are for games-based learning as opposed to those who don't know anything about games. There's still this unbridged gap of us trying to communicate to them that this is not just mindless fun, that it's actually very much a learning, multitasking, um, cognitively enhancing experience that can be leveraged to you know really help in learning absolutely and you know informing you know even district officials and curriculum supervisors and you know and parents I think that's going to be especially important you know as we continue to try to integrate you know games you know on our internet are blocked um, I have to put in for example a um, a service call um, ticket to get something unblocked um, because they have certain lists and our internet is blocked. So, um, and those decisions are not necessarily made by you know curriculum supervisors. It's just like a system type of decision um, for the district whitelist or the blacklist. Um, and teachers and technology resource teachers don't have you know control over that kind of thing. Um, so it's a you know definitely a process to you know help educate and enlighten others about the educational purposes and goals um, as we can you know use it more and more. And I think <laughs> and, and I, I was gonna I know Trish this is a question that that was asked and it's going back a little bit but it's asking it really is okay so. For the kids, are they afraid of the tests? <laughs> are they afraid of the computers? <laughs> so it's going back to what you related to us about the kids. Um, I have the, the one little boy, well, a couple of times, the, I have one little boy this year, and I really believe that it's, it's not the test per se. I think one thing, I mean, he cries when it's just coming in for technology, but when... I have them working on a task of um, where the, the computer will talk to you and it's teaching you about mouse manipulation. I think it's the voices coming from the computer frighten him. And he he's in and it's like a cartoon computer that's talking to him. That makes him cry. And then the test that he's taking, the questions are read to him because he's a kindergartner. And I think in that aspect, it's the voices coming from the computer that freak him out a bit. So, I, no, it's not just the test that's freaking him out. It's the computer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that goes back again to what Robert was saying about how, how games and how, we, especially if we're going to do computer-based testing, that we have to get, you know, our students can't freak out in the environment that they're put in and you know maybe our attitudes about computers are are sometimes spilling uh, and technology spilling over to them 
Well, and it's also that, in, especially with elementary kids, particularly in in our district, they're they're getting away from computers in our district and having them and trying to get all the tests on iPads. <laughs> so, um, um, what we're seeing is is I'm seeing a move away from computers two more mobile devices in schools. Our middle schools are using um, Chromebooks and our high schools are using Chromebooks and our elementary schools are using iPads. And, and so with that, I'd say um, we'll wrap this one up. I know we went long <laughs> and basic building and the basic building session is going to suffer a little because of it. <laughs> but, but you guys were so great. I don't think this is the only time we're going to have a, a chat like this. And, and we would love to bring Trish and, and Laura, both of you, back to talk about how you're doing it because you're both being you know, very strategic and very creative. When it, when it comes to, to, to bringing this into, into your school districts. And I just have to say, I applaud you and, and thank you for this. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I'm going to head over to the Minecraft build because <laughs> I'm the only one who usually ends up in survival mode there, so somebody will be able to revive me. <laughs> okay, so thank you guys. And Laura, I just want to thank you again for being in another one of our sessions. <laughs> My pleasure. And I'll see you all over on the Minecraft server. I was able to get in with Trevon's help. So okay. we'll see okay. you there. Bye, see everybody. Ya. Bye.